Okay, so um, this is Grandpa Hendrickson's book, True Tales, and um, uh, you know it's got a lot of cool stories in it. And this is part of our heritage. <clears throat> this is part of the legacy that he handed on to us. Now, the things that he handed on to us are the character issues, the character aspects or qualities that came out of this that were put in his life that in the raising of us then it's transferred from one generation to the other. But the way that virtues and character qualities are made are by circumstances. Circumstances create opportunities for character to be developed or not, sadly. But uh, anyway, so lots of great stories through which character was developed and then that began to fashion um, a person's uh, legacy, how they respond to issues, how they walk through issues, uh, creates a, a, a persona and a, and, a, and a gift mix, or not a gift mix, but a character mix, personality package, all told, that when they have their children, that personality package is what influences the way they raise them, and then for the next generation and on down. So each generation does that. Well, this is kind of important then that although we will never have these exact circumstances happen in our life, the principles and the value systems that got established or, uh, I'm sorry, got focused on and got drawn upon. In other words, you face an issue, you have the opportunity to respond like this or like this. Well, those principles are true for every generation. Circumstances different, principles the same. And so, um, I wanted to just point out two things. And uh, the reason I want to point out these two things is because it will be time for show and tell after I read the story. Right. So, um, I'll just start in the middle of a story here and just kind of work through it just a little bit. This particular story it won't have a lot of storyline. I want to I want to give an aspect or give an, a, a picture, an insight on a a tool that was used by Grandpa and by my great grandpa. It would be your great great grandpa. So it reads like this: to, to dislodge ourselves from the ice, we rocked the boat violently from side to side. Now, if you remember. This is their family out on the Mississippi River in the winter when ice flows, meaning not solid ice, but chunks, big chunks of ice. And it isn't just big chunks, it might be a whole quarter mile wide. So when that hits, I remember when I was a boy, and we lived right on the Mississippi River, our town was, a, was out on a point that stuck out in the river. Well, one winter... Uh, late winter, early spring, when the river was breaking up and all the ice was beginning to dislodge and became big ice flows. Well, when it came up against that point that stuck out in the river where our town was, the town was actually fearful that we might have to evacuate because ice piled up 10, 15 feet high and came in a half a block in onto this town. Fortunately, there were no houses right on the shore. And so that didn't destroy it. But the... Uh, the power of the ice flow could just come against that point going out in the river so powerfully that it just keeps piling up. So it has no concern for any resistance, especially a little boat. And here they are trying to jockey their way through these ice flows to get to the other side twice a day to go to school and back in a little boat where, in this case, it's... Uh, they're rowing across because uh, because everything had to be done by hand. You couldn't just set the motor and zip across, you know. Anyway, so we rocked the boat violently from side to side because they got stuck on top of an ice thing. This action broke and emulsified the ice on both sides, enabling us to float freely again. Sometimes it was so cold that the ice would, if they got stuck in the ice flow very long, 
uh, the ice would actually freeze to the side of the boat. And it's, so maybe they might have to float for a little while with the ice flow to get around another ice flow, right? So while they're floating, the ice is sticking, so they have to keep that thing jostling to, to break free. We carried a 52-inch pike pole. This is the very same one, the exact one that was used. Really? We carried a 52-inch pipe pole in the boat with us. Mildred, Mildred reminds me that we also carried in the boat a longer such pole. But striking the steel point of the pole into the ice on either side of the boat, one could push on the handle. So like this, there's an ice flow and it's coming in against and we can't get through, but if we push there into the ice, and push hard, it will push the boat or the ice flow, one or the other, so we could get around. Wow. On the other hand, you might want to grab something. You might want to grab something and pull your way into yeah. something. But this is the very tool, the exact same wow. tool that was used in the river wow. uh, by my dad, your grandpa, and by your great-grandpa. Wow. Mildred reminds me, by striking the steel point in a pole in the ice on either side of the boat, we could push on the handle. Caution was necessary lest the point break through and the occupant find, fall headlong overboard. Uh -huh. Let's say the ice is uh, not too thick, and you're thinking, man, I'm going to jab that thing, and it goes on through, and then you lose your balance, and you're gone over the thing. Wow. And Grandpa in the book tells of one boat... Uh, where something like that happened and two men were somehow lost and nobody knows why or how they got lost but they got drug in under the ice yeah. and they didn't find them until later when the ice all broke up and down the river. A second point on the end of the pole is angled so it could be thrust into the ice and used as a hook to pull us forward. Oh. So one is to pull and one is to push. Mildred and I were just a, too little in, too, a little too little in the poot to be of any help. We just sat hard on the dog seat to hold it down. From there, unafraid, we watched it all happen. Poor Dorothy, she was so worried she was fit to be tied. <laughs> was Dad praying under his breath? He may have been. I do know he sued for heaven's favor by his bedtime bedside nightly. I can clearly see him in his hip boots, positioned in the bow of the boat. He kept one foot in the boat, and the other, with the other, he broke open the ice around the bow, breaking through like that. And he kept a firm grip, firm grip on the bow cap, that's the very front of the boat, the, the top edge of the boat, so when the ice gave way under his weight, he could catch himself a straddle, the raising timber. I believe that is the... Uh, the center timber that comes up, like in big ships, that's where they, you, you get the point. Um, if the ice would not break under his weight, then he would lift the bow of the boat and pull it up onto the ice for added weight. So if the ice wouldn't break here, then he'd stand out here and pull the boat up onto the ice, and then they would, uh, I think in another place, I think we're going to read a little bit later, in another occasion where um, the kids would come up and their, their weight would break the ice so they could get on through that spot. Damn. If the That's ice did so not break, the larger person could transfer his weight forward and that until the bow would break through. In such cases, the bow sank suddenly to a scary dip, depth. In other words, you're up here and all of a sudden it breaks through and you're way higher than you should be, you know, than is normal in the water. And it breaks through and oh. looks like you're going to go on down, but... Anyway, in such cases, the bow sank done suddenly. It was a frightening situ sensation, but in time, we came to feel that this maneuver posed no real danger, except to Dorothy, who was, as I mentioned earlier, fit to be tied. So, by a little at a time, we freed ourselves and moved forward until we broke through into the next open water. At last, the bow of the boat connected with the icy shoreline of Missouri. Milton and I were stiff whipped from the cold. Nevertheless, when all was secured, we wasted no time getting our feet on solid ground again. 
Looking back to the island landing from which we had come, it seemed like a long way off. Now my dad must turn around and fight the ice to go back home and resume his day, day's work at the farm. Dad is at the oars now, and we three children wait a minute for Raymond to launch him away from the shore. They turn to go to school, and I wish the next three paragraphs were true, but they're not. And so he talks about a little imaginary scenario that he wishes that he had conveyed to his dad how much he appreciated his father's uh, bravado, courage, commitment, and all to bring the children back and forth across the island, uh, across the river. So uh, there you have. There's a little piece of our More. family's history. More of it. <laughs> <laughs> you want another story? Yeah, more. Bring it on. <laughs> That's good. We're not done.